At the tone, please record your message. When you have finished recording, you may hang up or press 1 for more options. So, Stephen, I just got back from my bike ride, and yes, I'm wearing spandex shorts. They look hot. My ass looks good in these. But you know what pisses me off? Runners who don't pay attention. I'm in the bike lane, and I'm riding, la di da di da doing like 15 miles an hour, 16 miles an hour, maybe more, because I can pedal. I got big legs. And this runner's on the sidewalk doing their thing on the sidewalk. Out of nowhere, she pulls a 90-degree turn and almost runs right into me if I didn't, like, scream at her in the last second and startle the shit out of her. Not only did I startle the shit, she had headphones in. She wasn't paying the fuck attention. She was literally running down the sidewalk and out of nowhere decides to make a sharp right turn in the middle of a block. Could you imagine if I was a truck or a bus or a car? She would have been dead. And if she ran into me, she would have hit a brick wall because, you know, I'm, I'm strong and all. This is a PSA to those runners. Pay the fuck attention. That woman's lucky I didn't kick her ass, Stephen. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> Actually... It's just not even lucky I didn't kick her ass. She's lucky I didn't run into her um, and hurt her. And honestly, I'm more concerned about hurting myself in a situation like that. The bike is an expensive bike. It's a Cannondale. So, of course, it, you, know, you got to protect the I don't care if Cannondale. I ran her down, but if I broke an arm, that's a different story. It is a different story because it would have been her fault. She would have been completely and utterly at fault. I don't want to hurt my bike, but I don't want to hurt myself. A bike is replaceable. Do you have a, woman, like, anything filming while you're riding, like a GoPro no, or some? Is there? No. I'm sure there's some kind of accessory you can buy, right? I could buy one of those police cams. And, or put and, in the and Insta360 and make it a dash cam. I could wear a police camera on my chest the whole time. It's not, wor- it's not worth the aggravation and the, you know, footage i mean i guess you would only use it if well, something did happen exactly you hope to never have to use it but if it did happen then you have the footage well there there was a woman at the walking her kid i think with a stroller down at the other you know not too far away who saw the whole thing it's just then my brain goes to does she have insurance if she causes an accident you know because as a bike rider you kind of should have some sort of insurance that you carry like liability sure. that if you cause an accident i do have insurance i have an umbrella policy over myself um for if uh, i punch someone and they sue me or if they just sue me just to sue me there's an umbrella policy that my my agent he's like look it's like 180 bucks a year and it gives you x amount of extra coverage i'm not saying what x is because then someone wants to sue me for that amount <laughs> but i have that i have extra coverage just in case but it what it it was it happened so fast and being that i'm clipped into my pedals there was no way that i would be able to pop out yeah. and like skid stop yeah it's it's just frustrating. How close were you actually to hitting her? Were you literally like ten feet, feet. away and Yeah. Okay. You weren't feet. like fifty feet away. You were literally like no, I'm it wasn't hit fifty you. feet away. You weren't no, pulling an Austin was... Powers where you're like, move <laughs> and they're hundred feet away. No, you know how close I was is that when she was startled and put her arms up when I fucking yelled, I was so close that when she was doing that, I made eye contact right like parallel as I was passing her when she was stopping her motion oh you gave her the eyes Ooh. well, well i had to give her something you gave her the f you eyes well i know it was more like what the fuck are you doing exactly <laughs> but that's the that's the shock of the first thing is your first reaction is what the fuck are you doing without even looking you turn and make a 90 degree turn into the bike lane which is that where was she going was she going across the street hold on hold on don't interrupt me god damn it okay Hold on, I'm kidding. But what? What? Where was she gonna go? Because if I wasn't there and a car was coming, she didn't look at all. That's what pisses me off. Okay, can I talk now? Yes. <laughs> I, I mean, that's why you need to wear something like the AirPods that have the transparent mode or something, where you can still hear the music or whatever you're listening to, whether it be an awesome podcast like Raw Talk, but you can also hear your surroundings and the ambient noise. Because the second someone's like, "Hey, move or watch out." Or four, if you're on a golf course, <laughs> something like that, you know, you need to pay attention. You need to. I think you can still listen to your podcast and music, but just be responsible about it. It's called situational awareness. It's called common sense. Well, yes, it is. And I don't think you should be listening to your headphones when you're running. Imagine you're running through the countryside. la di da di da You don't listen to anything when you're bike riding? Nope. Just my inner thoughts. Really? Wow. Really? Okay. 
don't care if it's 20 miles, 10 miles, or 60 miles. Oh, I'm not wow. listening to anything because I don't want the distraction. I don't want, I need to be aware of my surroundings. I need to know if the bike is making a weird noise. If the bike is making a weird noise and I hear, like, you might not hear the clicking of the, when I change my gears with my uh, wireless uh Bluetooth paddles, you know, because it's <laughs> it's a really expensive Cannondale. With my five hundred dollar Bluetooth, uh, whatever. <laughs> no, that doesn't cost me. That's part of the bike. It's the, joke. It's included it's joke. in the bike. Sometimes it misses the the shift, and so it starts doing this clicking noise. Mm. Well, if you don't hear that, you're between gears. You're not in a good space. You could end up getting hurt. And so for me, it's all about situational awareness in whatever situation I'm in. Like you're walking down a sidewalk, and there's four of you. You know, two couples. Do you take up the whole sidewalk or do you do two by two or do you get out of the way when someone's coming? Like the worst Clearly is when you're entourage style, just taking up the yeah. entire length of the sidewalk. <laughs> the worst is when you're walking down the street and I'm on the right side, right? You're on the right side. You're supposed to be on the right side, not the left side, the right side walking. So the other people are on the right side walking towards you. But then you get these people who are, are walking towards you on the left side and they want you to get out of the way i'm not getting out of the way you're in the wrong here i sound like larry david again especially if you're on a bike path one you really shouldn't be walking there but there's also walking paths and running paths that they intersect sure. because yeah it's just like along the, the the banks but have some awareness that you're not the only one on the on on the uh, on the path right now so if some you know you need to be able to I, I say on your left, right? I say on your left when I'm passing someone or when I'm coming up behind someone, I'm like on your left, meaning they're probably in the way at that point. One, you want to give them notice that you're there. So don't try like runners. Sometimes they will not look because they have headphones in and they or they just don't look at all. And they start to pass a walker who's going slow as you're coming up behind them and they never look. They just step out. Right. So I try to say on your left, on your left. And a lot of times the assholes have their headphones in, which is awfully frustrating when you're trying to go by and they're running and you're like on your left and you look over they don't even react because they didn't hear you i had a guy scream that in my ear probably the last week or two i was walking chip my dog and we're on the sidewalk he's in the street and i didn't see him at all and i'm just simply on the sidewalk i'm not going in the street and right before he gets to us like two feet he's like screaming on your left i'm like dude he startled both of us. I'm like, I'm not even in the street or am I even going in the street at all? Like, what, you don't have to scream it every time. I think, like you said, it's more of a precaution when, like, someone is in the street or something like that where you really have to say it. But I'm like, whoa, dude, come on. Yeah, tell him to calm down, then throw a stick in his spokes. <laughs> Big Daddy style. <laughs> yeah. Take that bike guy. Anyway, welcome to uh, Raw Talk episode number 47, where we talk about bikes, Cannondales. It has Cannondales. Really in it. expensive bikes. Welcome to anybody who's new here who came here because on uh, Photo News Fix, I said, maybe don't listen to the last episode if you get offended easily. That was really sub, sub, you know, trying to tell people that you might be offended. You should probably listen. You know, you know, Ooh, you know what I'm trying to do there? I was just like, yeah, maybe don't listen to it if if um if you're offended by the Easter Bunny being German and me going off on a rant about it. <laughs> well, maybe I I, don't do it. Didn't I call you up after? I'm like, mm, I don't know. Should I cut that? It's a little you probably much. Said it, you probably said it five seconds after, and I was like, no. You left it in there. You left that part in. You should have left it in. There was nothing wrong with it. I know, because you said it's fine. Yes, it was fine. And how many complaints did we get, Stephen? Uh, zero. That we that we know of. <laughs> zero. <laughs> zero. Until and someone good. comments and, it, and leaves a nasty review. Yeah, but if someone was offended and they didn't comment, then that's what you're supposed to do. Be offended. Leave. Don't listen. <laughs> Turn it off. Speaking of comments, Stephen, was there a really good one that came in? A really good star rating that came in on the iTunes? There was. And Do you want to read it? Dr. Broker Scholl posted on the 15th can't wait for every friday well 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 if it isn't the podcast that makes my ears perk up like a dog hearing the word treat that's right i'm talking about jared poland and steven eckert's raw talk the photography podcast that's equal parts informative and entertaining first off let's talk about the banter between these two it's like listening to a stand-up comedy routine but instead of jokes they're dishing out photography insights the way they play off each other is a sight to behold or rather a sound to behold <laughs> and they make it easy to forget that you're actually learning something while you're chuckling away but make no mistake 
mistake, the photography insights on this podcast are no laughing matter. From gear reviews to industry news to tips and tricks for getting the perfect shot, these guys know their stuff and they don't just regurgitate the same old tired advice you've heard a million times before. No, they offer up fresh perspectives and unique takes on the art of photography. Woo, he's go- he keeps going on. Was there a- more? Yeah. What's also great about Raw Talk is that it's not just for professional photographers. Hobbyists and amateurs alike can benefit from the knowledge dropped on this podcast. And with new episodes dropping regularly, there's always something new to learn and discover. So in conclusion, if you're looking for a photography podcast that's both informative and hilarious, Raw Talk is the one for you. Jared and Steven's banter is second to none, and their insight into the world of photography are truly top notch. Give it a listen and see for yourself why it's the talk of the town, or rather, the Raw Talk of the town. From Eric Scholl in Seattle, Washington. Sir, thank you for that awesome review. That, uh, that really made me smile. Was that you, Jared? <laughs> <laughs> it was me. It wasn't me. But did you realize what he said, though? What? Jared, then Steven. Well, clearly, it's your podcast first. I came first. Well, of course. It's on the Frodo's but- Photo channel. Which takes us all the way back to the original Raw Talks and a discussion and you, argument you really that we had. started the Raw Talk podcast. Yes. Remember this argument? Did I ever tell you about the argument at the very, very, we're talking before you, Ari, Greg, all those guys were around? Uh, uh, I don't know. Remind me. Yeah, We had a little discussion once where one of the people on the show said that I was the co-host and that they were the host. And I was like, this well, was let me not get this me, straight. by the way, just to clarify. I no, did not this Steven it. wasn't even in existence yet. But <laughs> it was like, wait, wait, let me let me get this straight. It's called Frono's Photo Raw Talk. And I'm the co-host Clearly, of Frono's Photo Raw Talk? You're the host, yes. I'm the host. You're the sidekick guy. I agree. But I don't give a fuck. Like, why does it matter? Like, it doesn't matter. But anyway, thank you to Guy in Sleepless in Seattle for for the perfect uh where just give me your venmo i'll say i'll tell you where i need to send that tell me where i need to send that money um because that was a very good review can we just like copy and paste this entire review and put it as the description on all the platforms of the podcast because it really is a perfect recap and summary of what the podcast is yeah, that's funny steven because i also got a very nice email and i'll read that later but i got an interesting email that's uh, in the same vein about the type of stuff that we put out which is like they nailed it it's it's really nice when people know was this you did you send this email <laughs> well you left the review right and then i sent the email remember that's what we were gonna talk oh, about today is that what it was yeah yeah shit <laughs> well you we don't want to tell people that <laughs> welcome Steven, to the cut podcast where we brag about ourselves all day no i just it's just nice to get positive affirmations that that actually hit the nail on the head I sometimes agree. and so it's nice when that happens but i'll read that a little later right before we got on to raw talk i was working on my paris photo video because mm. i decided not to do a vlog but i thought it would be better to share the images that i captured show some of the good the bad the indifferent uh and also give you why i like one image versus why i like the other and give you the stories behind them slightly i i use it as a very informative and educational uh piece of content did you record it already i did that's oh, okay. why i was a little late to meet you for this oh okay gotcha how to turn out I, I, good i wanted to get it done well luckily for me i stopped at 22 minutes of the first recording to take a quick break because i didn't want to go over 29 59 because that's what the stupid camera still yep, record the r5s yep. Only to realize there was only two minutes left on the card because I didn't reformat the 165 card when I put it into the camera. So I saved myself from being upset that I kept going. So that was good. Did the second part. Um, and it's probably a 30 some minute video. Wow. Uh, and I'm going to give it to Dan to edit. It's a straight through edit though because it's all screen flow. Okay. Yeah. It, straight it's up easy. multi-cam cut probably it's, takes two hours max to get it, out. It shouldn't take that much time. There's very little to cut. There's there's a few things, but not not a lot. My main focus of making the video was that old saying that I've been saying for a long time is if you're in Paris at the Eiffel Tower hmm. and you take a super tight headshot portrait, but you can't tell that you're in Paris at the Eiffel Tower, then you might as well have just shot it in your basement. I went ahead and I took a photo of my buddy Troy in front of the Eiffel Tower, but you couldn't tell that we were in Paris at the Eiffel Tower. I'm so glad you did that because like you said, you reference that all the time and I have nothing to show ever. Now we can finally show this picture every single time you mention it. And we can show it. And then I've got other images that show how to utilize the landmark, how Mm -hmm. to utilize the tower that it's part of the image, but it's not the main focus and how to do a portrait with it. And I'm happy with the shots that I got of my buddy Troy. And it was awesome because we were there. I was like, I'm here. I should do this. 
and and I and I did. Good so, call. Yeah. So I recorded that video. I, I, I show some of the pictures from Normandy. I didn't plug. Oh, you the presets. did take pictures in Normandy. I didn't think you did. I did take some. We were at the cemetery. I don't know oh. if I saw those photos yet. Usually you'll send no, me No, that's because I actually just did them. Okay. I just edited them. They've been sitting around. Hmm. Uh, but what's interesting is when you go to the cemetery where the, the allies are, are, are buried and the, the U.S. soldiers, the American soldiers are buried that died there, mm-hmm. I was looking for tombstones, the, the Jewish star headstone tombstones, because mm-hmm. yeah. it's either a cross or a Jewish star. Sure. And I, you know, Obviously, I'm Jewish. I wanted to find those. The first one I find, I take I take pictures of it, right? I walk up to it. I read the name, and it's Joseph L. Ville. Died June 7th, 1944, and it says from PA. So I was like, oh, my God, they're from Pennsylvania, hmm. which one was interesting. Two, I also, quick side note, is that the crosses actually put the, the, the whole town and this whole state they're from and the Jews miss out because there's not as much room on a Jewish star for them to put the full Pennsylvania. So it just says PA uh. and it doesn't say where at in PA. But I also walked on the grass, which was cordoned off. You weren't supposed to walk on the grass. I walked on the grass. I, I asked a groundkeeper just if it was okay or, or, or what uh, they have it. Yeah. They don't want people real. I mean, the tour guide told us that that was new re, as of recent because they just redid the grass or something. Mm. So yes, you could walk on it normally, but here they had it cordoned off, but I, he, he went up and asked the groundskeeper, is it okay? And they said, yes, just make it quick. Go do it. I would have done it anyway, without permission, to be honest with you. <laughs> I'm say. just saying, <laughs> uh, but we did ask first uh, and it was totally fine because it was away from everybody else. Dive even deeper Turns out this person was from Philadelphia. Wow. This Josephville was from Philadelphia. And I have a street address from when he was 19 because the census is online and you can see where he lived. And he died at 23 years old Whew. the day after uh, the invasion. So it says D-Day plus one. That was June 7th. Sure. And he died, they said, clearing the water of mines when he got shot by a sniper. How do they even know that, though? Well, There's that was the next thing happening. is they don't. They have to put something it's on it. It's just a, a a good guess, I guess, right? It's possible because who would have known? Like, there's no what, one. Do you think they sit there yeah. and interview every person that was in the water next to him at the time? And, and I'm sure you don't know every single soldier, you know? No, and it's it's just like um, the the Tillman Tillman, sorry, not Al Tillman's the no, photographer I know what you mean, yeah. Tillman. He um, turns out he was killed by friendly fire, and they hid the fact. You know, the government hid that fact which was very anyway don't want to go down that road i guarantee but, many people died of friendly fire yeah but i just found it interesting that this tombstone this headstone said pa and then i look it up when i get home and it's philadelphia that was the first one that i happened upon could you find his address at the time well it has the address yeah ninth street and it said like 50 20 ninth street i'd have okay. to look that up to see where it was not too far and he had a daughter he had a daughter four months old when he was died <sighs> when he died shame widow 24 years old and daughter four months old so he may not have ever met his daughter potentially sure and obviously the daughter wouldn't remember him so the daughter would be my dad's age at this point wow we're very close to my dad's age yeah i would think that the family has visited his tombstone at this point yeah i mean i was gonna say i said this in the video that the only reason you would go to normandy because i do not recommend that you take a trip from paris to go to normandy unless a family member was directly involved mm-hmm. or you have some ownership to wanting to be there because uh, other it's really just a beach it's just a beach town at this point yeah and there's really nothing there it's not like it was you know 90 years ago 80 some years ago yeah it's not like the set of uh saving private ryan you know it's it's quite cleaned up i'm sure by now yeah. So you want to start moving into some photo news? Let's do it. Let's move into some photo news, starting with Adobe Lightroom updates. What did you find out that Adobe went ahead and did? Uh, well, the big ones in the 12.3 release that just came out, what, yesterday? I think you updated while we were at work and you're like, oh, look, look, uh, the new noise reduction option is there. Yeah, that's so, exactly what I said. Speaking of that, it's a, it's a new denoise button. They kind of hid now the uh, normal manual noise reduction sliders that you would normally see, which I still kind of prefer them because with this new denoise AI button, what it's doing is basically... 
uh, sharpening certain things, but then smoothing out certain things in the image using AI, kind of like what Topaz Labs do. Uh, I mean, they're clearly going after Topaz with this new update, but it creates a new DNG, which is a little annoying. So every single time you want to you know, do custom noise reduction by using this button, you're going to have another separate virtual file, another separate DNG, which is a little annoying, which yeah, to me makes better. it seem like it's clearly not non-destructive. It is a destructive uh, no. editing tool, if I had to guess. Well, no, it's not destructive because it's yeah, saving it as a DNG. It's saving it, whereas the others have to do it on a JPEG. They do it on your RAW, but it's saving exporting as like a, a TIFF. So now you're editing a TIFF or, or a JPEG, and here no, no. you have a DNG file. Yeah, but what I'm saying... Uh, I'm not talking about Topaz and everything else. I'm talking about the Lightroom sliders right now are non-destructive where you can simply slide the sliders left, right, left, right, and it's not making a DNG every single time. No. I wish you could just click the button, it applies the edit, and then you can simply remove it if you wanted to after the right. fact instead of having to create a whole separate DNG because they specifically say if you want to do any masking or any cleanup with like the brush tool, you do it after you do the denoise slider because again, it's it's making a whole new DNG. It's a great step forward with, uh, with using AI and incorporating that in into Lightroom, just like they did with the masking tool, which by the way, the masking tool, they also updated that and it now has facial hair recognition and clothes recognition that you can use. So if you have a beard like yourself, uh, you can simply click, you know, the masking tool and the adjustment brush and it has facial hair and it'll automatically highlight your facial hair and you can adjust that from there. Take That's out all the cool. gray hair and all that. Kind of <laughs> well, so I would, again, I don't like editing like that. I don't like, I was, I was doing a, yeah, it depends what type of photo it is. Like I'm not going to do this on every single photo. Well, I was doing a mentorship with someone and they had really good portraits, really cool, compelling images, except for the fact that they overdid the edits. The sure. skin, they would skin smooth the women and I, he would show me the before and the after. And I was like, look, this is how this teenager in high school looks when you take out like the cleaning up of the hair, like that's cool. Cleaning up the hair and flyaways. I think blemishes that's one too. Thing. But I, all I ever say is a blemish that is part of your face doesn't get removed unless the only thing that gets removed is if it's not normally there. Exactly. And it just so happened to be there on the day. Like I'm not going to remove a mole, but I'll remove, you know, a pimple or something like that. Right. But people take it to the extreme. And I just told them, I'm like, this is too much editing. One, it takes you forever to edit it. You should probably use a softer light source, which means you need a bigger soft box, go bigger uh, to help soften the light, to give you a much softer light when you're taking those photos with the strobes versus something that's smaller and, and more harsh. So if you go softer to begin with, the skin's going to be a little softer. But I'm not the type of portrait or like portrait person where I want to see everything touched up. I'm not going to do it myself. And I also think it's, again, misleading, giving people a false sense of what they should look like, think they should look like um, versus what they actually do look like. So like I said, I'm not a fan of that. You got like Lindsay Adler out there. I love her work. I like what she does. But it's to me, it's highly stylized that it almost comes across like an artist rendering after a while. Uh, no, I agree on that. I think that that kind of stuff, like the commercial stylized look goes a little too far. For, it ends up looking completely fake in my opinion, but I will, I will counter that with, you know, using a crazy amount of contrast or a crazy amount of sharpening or something like that might do the complete opposite and bring out that detail in the face that you might normally not see when you're just yeah, looking so at someone so face to face. Exactly. Don't go uh, boomified on a face. Were oh, you trying to tell me? Are you trying? Was that a direct? Was that <laughs> no, directed not towards at me? All. I mean, it's only someone that uses a ton of contrast. <laughs> But when it comes to people, I do it differently, Stephen. It depends. I, I think when yeah, you it do depends. A, when you do a portrait headshot, I don't think you go nuts with it. But uh, I think in general, you're still using a lot of contrast. And I think the contrast slider is way different than using something like the curves tool, uh, the tone curve, for example. Which, by the way, they do have now a new curves. Uh, <laughs> Turves. Turves? They knew it. They have a new curves option in the masking settings. So if you are using the adjustment brush, you can now adjust specifically just the curves when you're doing your uh, touch ups or whatever it may be, which is nice. Yeah. I mean, I probably won't use that really, but it is nice to have a little more flexibility. Yeah. And speaking of the AI masking option, too, you know, I do really like that you can simply just select skin and it's going to automatically select the entire face and just the skin, you know, not the lips, the eyes, everything else that you don't want softened. So it is a lot quicker to do these edits these days with this AI technology versus back in the day when you had to manually do the entire face and make sure you don't get the lips and the eyes and every little, you know, the facial hair that you still want to keep nice and sharp. So it's, it's really nice and convenient to have that new option. Is there an option to just pick the eyes straight yep. up? Yep. There's an option for just the irises and then the actual whites around your eye. I forget what that's I need actually that. called. 
that's called your eyes. But, no, but there's an actual <laughs> name for it. The yoke. Yeah, yeah, something like that. It's I thought I think I it starts know. with an S or something. Really? Yeah, yeah. I was just at the eye doctor again yesterday. I need you need to show me where that's at because I just usually go in there with the brush tool and just dodge out the eye. Dude, literally, personally. it's like two clicks. You hit the adjustment brush, it automatically uh, finds the person or the subject in the frame, and then it breaks down each part of the oh. body. So eyes, iris, you know, lips, nose, whatever it may be. And again, now it's gonna have facial hair. So if you're someone like Drake and Manny Ortiz, you're gonna have Man. you can still uh, mask out your facial hair, make it super dark and clean and fresh. That's cool. Yeah, I, I need to. I need to do that because every once in a while I go in and I do the eyes at like point three seven plus on the yep. exposure. Very Just a subtle. little bit. Like very I have subtle. I have shit brown eyes, so my eyes are super dark every time I take a photo. So I always have to go in there and brighten them up a lot. Yeah, you said it. Hashtag <laughs> shit brown eyes, Stephen. Mister Hash, Mister uh, Mister Shit Brown Eyes. He says very very dark. Yes. So anyway, Adobe is definitely going directly after these denoising softwares, which I despise anyway. Um, they just want to be the catch-all, which is interesting because some people are upset about Premiere the, lately and saying that Premiere hasn't kept up to date and it crashes and that's why they've been moving to DaVinci Resolve. You've been seeing all these videos about... You mean some people, I, like five people? <laughs> well, exactly. <laughs> I, Justine, and Peter McKinnon's guy, and then Matty Hapoya. So if Peter does it, then, then, the, then the other dope squad people are going to say that they're doing it too. But my whole thing is, one, I don't know that these people aren't getting paid by DaVinci exactly. to, to at least use it. And I'm not saying that any of those men people I just mentioned are doing that. I don't know for a fact, but it's kind of odd that out of nowhere, in a short span of time, a bunch of people started saying, I'm switching to this and I'm switching to that. And oh, it's just working so good because I'm not a, I'm not a video editor, but I also knew that there were some people who did switch to it that were putting out a bunch of information like, how do I fix this? This is an issue I'm having. So as much as I love the color and everything in DaVinci Resolve, which, hey, I will say I've only used DaVinci Resolve a handful of times. And that was mainly when I was messing around with like the 8K 60p raw option from the Nikon Z9, um, because DaVinci Resolve would be the, was the only platform that would open that up. But my big thing about Premiere is that I use the dynamic linking tool, which basically lets you round trip and open any other Adobe software and pretty much go from like, I can open Adobe Audition, edit the audio, file save, and then it's automatically saved back in Premiere. Everything's tied together. Same with After Effects and all the other programs. And I really like that they do that. And that would, as much as I love the color with DaVinci Resolve, I think there's so many more pros that Premiere Pro offers at the end of the day Beep. than cons. Beep. Beep, beep, Steven. Adobe, did you hear that? You, That's the money truck you got all the backing money? up from Adobe. Okay, cool. Yeah, we're not getting money from Adobe. <laughs> we haven't gotten the sponsored wish. thing I from Adobe. I barely get 12 and You barely do. Uh, Adobe stock sponsored me when I went to Paris the first time in 2019. So we made that video for Adobe stock back then. Uh, and and we did a, a Lightroom 30 for 30, what, like 2014, oh, that maybe was 2015. Way back. That was when Dan first started with us. That had to be seven yeah. years ago. Yeah. That was the first thing he edited, but he wasn't full time yet. I actually bought him the laptop. You're right. Yeah. And that was one of the things he got to keep at the time. But that was one of the things we did with Adobe. Adobe hasn't been spending, they don't spend money on, on us creators anymore. It seems like they spend it on uh, musicians mm. to promote. Like Billie Eilish did the whole video. That's true. Uh, a whole, a whole advertisement. I mean, that's a big with campaign though. Yeah. Well, they're trying to get other people to download the the uh, the mobile app and and get into the suite so that they can compete with these other apps that have millions upon millions of users and are taking away from potential customers for Adobe. And I still think a lot of people are using Lightroom Mobile these days, people that aren't even photographers. You know, again, my wife uses Lightroom Mobile to now edit her photos from the phone, which blows my mind. I think they finally started to really win over that market of the everyday person using that app, which, uh, which shocks me because Lightroom Mobile re really isn't catered towards that type of audience, you know, that, that type of non-photographer. Yeah, just move a couple sliders, hit a couple buttons, and call it a day. When, what a person does in the app. Yeah, but I think a lot of people are using Lightroom Mobile because of presets. Like my sister, for example, literally bought a pack of presets uh, before she even realized that I have my own. <laughs> and she bought a pack of presets, and that's why she uses Lightroom Mobile, because they only work in Lightroom Mobile. Yeah. So I think that's why people are using Lightroom Mobile, specifically women. It would be really good if they allowed us to get our presets in there much easier for people I that know. don't have a Lightroom subscription. They really force you to make sure you have the entire suite, you know, or, or just an Adobe Lightroom subscription in general. Whatever. 
Uh, so good updates from Adobe there. Yeah. Uh, n- next up, there were two cameras announced while I was in Paris or right around the time or a little after. If you didn't know, I was in Paris. Um, <laughs> that that are Tell monochrome <laughs> monochrome first cameras meaning they don't shoot color at all they don't have a color sensor they are monochrome and it's kind of nuts because one of them i mean you expect one to be leica right you expect leica to do this because they've been doing it well, for a while yeah they've done it a few times yeah but you don't expect it to be pentax you don't expect pentax to come out with a dslr that is a monochrome dslr crop sensor camera it's the K3 Mark three turned into a monochrome camera. It's just like the dumbest thing. And it was funny when you listen or read the quote from the, uh, the Rico guy, you know, not uncle Rico, (laughs) but the Rico imaging guy who's like, well, in uh, 2020 or 2021, we held, and this is me paraphrasing. We held, a fan forum online and it seemed to be a popular idea that people wanted. 27 people showed up. (laughs) It's like you had 12 people there and if you're going to turn to your comment section to direct which way you should be taking your business, Steve Jobs would come and kick you in the nuts because Steve Jobs was the guy who was like oh that's what you people want? No. I'm going to give you what you need and what you know you don't have yet or you don't know that you don't need yet. I I mean hey, they they must be selling cameras though if they're still in existence and putting out new cameras. No, there, there's no, no Steven. Yeah, but if they're not, why would they still be? I don't understand how they're even funded at this point. Tax write-offs. Uh, yeah, but I don't know. I think of like well, Olympus. I, I feel like Olympus was a much bigger brand and they didn't survive. You know, I mean, they're yeah, OM1 Rico, now, but. But Rico is a big imaging company when it comes to the printer division. They have a ton of printers like Canon makes money off of their like a lot of money off of their office printing and solutions. Same thing with Rico. That's how they make a lot of their money to keep funding this type of bullshit. Sure. But I just think they would they would then focus all of their technology towards the printer division, not so much the camera division if that's selling so poorly. You know what I mean? But hey, who knows? Maybe it's not. Maybe they sell like hotcakes, which I doubt. But (laughs) don't forget, it's a write down. So the money that they can spend here is money that they can then write off and take the tax break for and so it might be economically better if they make big big money on their rico imaging stuff when it comes to printers and maybe they have a large tax bill that they want to skirt by writing down 50 million dollar loss or whatever they write down from the imaging division yes they still have to spend the money but they save it on the taxes and while they're still generating some other stuff at least that's my conspiracy idea. I'm looking on B&H right now, and there's you know 63 reviews for their K1 Mark II DSLR. Uh, I think that's one yeah, of their latest old. DSLRs, right? No, the K3 Mark III. K th- well, that's their new, new one, right? Right. What's the K3 Mark II? I don't know. This K3 Mark II, it has a less, one less Roman numeral. I don't even see a Mark II. I don't Steven, know. Honestly, I, I, I don't, don't know, know much about Pentax. I don't know shit about Pentax either. <laughs> so that, that also brings us to the other camera, which was the Leica, the uh, M11 monochrome. And it's such a joke. I have a friend that I follow on Instagram that he's always posting because he went and got a Leica M11 color and some Sumalux lens. And he's dra- traveling to New York and he's taking photos and he's making it look moody with the certain presets and certain editing style. Yeah, and he's like, I can do the same Man. thing on any other camera. I just love the color. I love it. Just look at the dimension. Look what you get. Yes, you do get some cool shapes and dimensions from that piece of glass. But I can um, go take a picture of the Eiffel Tower if you didn't know I was in Paris. Take the picture of the Eiffel Tower in color with an R8. Turn it into a black and white image that is looks gorgeous because of the lens I was using. And you're never going to be like, hey, this wasn't taken with Leica. You know, I, it's just so pretentious. The, 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 the Leica game still. And, and the Leica M11 monochrome is $9,000. To be exact, it's $9,200. Yeah. Yeah. It's insane. Insane in the membrane. I just, I'd rather buy a flagship from another brand and then buy a ton of glass for that kind of money. $9,200, Stephen. $9,200. Do you know what you could buy with $300 more than $9,200? Uh, a new Canon 100 to 300 2.8. Beep, beep, beep. Back that truck up to Steven's house. Oh, I got a doobie and Canon today. Yes. That's right. Canon money truck. Uh, well, you're going to need a Canon money truck to buy the. Uh, I'll, look, Leica, monochrome. 
for $9,200. I look at it as if it's like Louis Vuitton of where course. my friend Katie, she You're bought a Louis Vuitton bag. Yeah. Well, yeah, she bought a bag in Paris. I was like, why didn't you buy a Chanel? And she's like, well, I didn't want to spend three times as much as what I spent. I don't know what she spent, but it probably had a three in front of it. Like $3,000 on a bag. It's a very nice bag. I sniffed it. It smells like leather, but she wanted one. And then the Leica, isn't it like four frames a second or something? I know it's 60 megapixels, oh. which is always nice, but I, I always thought their frame rate was like super low. There's nothing like that blows me away when it comes to their specs. You know, I get well, it. It's a different look with a Leica, but ah, it's a lot it's of money. It's a range finder. Look, I don't want to be blown away by finder, their specs, yeah. but I don't want to be blown away, but I don't want 20 frames a second with a Leica. I think I would rather see a vintage Leica design with a film winder and you have to wind it every time you want to take a picture you really want to go school and they don't even they shouldn't even focus on video i hate the fact that they focus on video at all with a leica just focus on the goddamn photos make it a winder that only allows you to take another picture when you wind it again like that's what i would like to see does this one do video though i thought it was strictly like stills they all do video in one way or another the monochrome one though I don't know if the monochrome one did. They didn't send me one, so I don't know. Yeah, I don't but know the point I was making is is the people buying Leicas, it's like buying a Louis Vuitton. It's mm -hmm. like buying uh, Dolce & Gabbana. It's like buying the Chanel type product because you're showing off. It's like buying a Tesla. Yo, it's not. Well, <laughs> speaking of buying a Tesla, Stephen, it's not that expensive. It's almost cheaper than buying a Leica to buy a Model 1. My car right now. You can buy four you can or buy, five Leicas for that. <laughs> you can buy my car right now that I bought four months ago in December is down to $49,999. Sorry, wow. $4,990 for a Tesla Model Y long range in white. I bought it in gray. It didn't cost me more at the time, but it's an extra thousand dollars for the gray, extra 1500 for black, extra like 2000 for blue and, and red. And you bought it because it was much lower in price at that point, right? So if someone bought uh, it a year ago, they no, spent it, way more, right? It wasn't lower in price. It was that they were offering $7,500 off lower in price so it was like 60 yeah well it was like 62 grand less the 7500 because yeah. i knew i wasn't going to be eligible for the tax incentive that was coming in march of 2023 so the tax incentive means if you make less than three hundred thousand dollars in a household meaning you and your wife file and you make less than that then you're eligible or if you're a single buyer and you make less than one hundred fifty thousand dollars, you're eligible for that tax credit of seven uh, $7,500. Now that's a gotcha. tax credit at the end of the year. So I mean, if you yeah. don't make a shit ton of money and you don't owe 7,500, you, maybe you get a refund back at that point, but they've dropped the prices tremendously on their Teslas and for under 50 grand, you know, and to get the $7,500 off, if you, if you do, it's not a bad purchase at all. If you want to go electric at this point. Uh, after this and, uh, Adobe and Canon money truck backing up to my house, I don't think I'll be uh, eligible for that tax uh, exemption either. <laughs> Do you want one for your wife, a Tesla? <laughs> no, no, we're good. You're good? You really don't want one? Uh, I just, I'd rather be a little more frugal with my money and buying a car. Back to the Canon lens discussion, because I, uh, I, had, to, I had to finish up on that other thing. Uh, Canon, out of nowhere, I mean, Canon rumors kind of We got actually it a week. did not know about this. We didn't know we didn't know anything about this. We didn't. Uh, Canon 100 to 300 f 2.8. Now Nikon has had a 120 to 300 2.8. Sigma has had two versions at least of the 120 to 300 2.8s that were heavy and shitty. But both of Nikon's, those are also for DSLR mounts. Right, and Nikon's was great. I used it last year for the yep. first time, and man, but it was over seven pounds. They released what it does, right before they switched to mirrorless, right? Well, mirrorless was already out, or the, or yeah, Z6, like right when they, Z7 was out. It was a few months later, yeah. What's the weight on this? Uh, do you have the spec sheet for this? Because I have it up too if you need it. I got I, it. I don't have the weight now. I do. It's. I think it's 5.9 pounds is the weight of the Canon. Yeah, 93.5 ounces, 5.8 pounds, uh, and it's 12.7 inches long. I had to, you know, I know what 12.7 inches looks like, and I was like, that's not that big. <laughs> it's not that big at all. Uh, I was but, waiting for it. 12.7 inches long was just was like I took the 100 to 500 on photo news and I zoomed it out a little bit and I measured it I'm like, with the with the well with the, that's an external zooming lens too so it's way longer you know when it's fully zoomed out than this 100 to 300 will be since it's internally zooming well I wasn't fully zoomed out I was just showing what um what 12.7 inches looks like yeah yeah, yeah. 
there because I actually went on to uh, Amazon and typed in 12.7 inch dildo and only thing I could find was a 12.6 inch and I didn't have enough time to order it to bring it out for the video and no the one in my floor at the house is only 8.5 inches Stephen. <laughs> Jesus but there is one on on Amazon if you're looking you could buy a um good to know good a, to know a sex toy well I, I looked it up on Amazon Stephen. of course you I did. wanted to I wanted to give someone a representation of what 12.7 inches looks like. I wonder if people think you're joking, but I know that you actually did this. You definitely did this for real. (laughs) Here, Steven, check this out. Everybody, turn your speakers up really loud. (laughs) Alexa, search dildos on Amazon. (laughs) You just pissed off a whole lot of people. Add dildos to your cart. (laughs) Uh, Hey, Siri. Add dildos to your cart. See, I turn all that crap off, man. Alexa, Siri, all that stuff. I never, ever use the uh, the voice option. <laughs> I wonder when how I, many, When I order you know, my dildos. <laughs> when, you, when you order your dildos. How did we get on dildo talk, Steven? I don't freaking know, man. I am trying to get my hands on one of these lenses. And I do have an opportunity to get one because I've got some sporting things to shoot. And... Uh, I'm really curious to see how light it is. If it's hand holdable at 5.9, I ounce, think it's uh, definitely going to be hand holdable for me. Rem- remember the the Sigma like 200 to 600 or, or 150 to 600. I forget which one it was. That was about six pounds, and you could hand hold really? that. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Well, I forget which it was one of those mega zooms. I mean, I want to see if it's really comfortable to do that if it is good and if it is a short throw from 100 to 300 this is great it's 100 to 300 2.8 all the way through except for the fact that it's a 9500 dollars lens it's 300 dollars more than the leica but if you look back at what a 300 2.8 would sell for new probably seven ish grand yeah, I think they were like it, 60 it some hundred dollars so yeah actually this is a lot more expensive but you're getting a lot more bang for your buck and and then the, the, the nikon uh, for comparison is literally like the same price it's 9500 $9, yeah. yeah it's 9500 dollars for the yeah. nikon and that i mean i shot it on the z9 and it worked great mm-hmm. i think it worked great on the z9 it was just so heavy at seven point like four pounds they're super heavy this is interesting because in, in in some facets it's a good lens for shooting field sports like if you're shooting softball you're shooting little league if you're shooting baseball it might be a little too short depending on where you're shooting from like for major league baseball 120 100 to 300 is probably a little short for my taste mm-hmm. um it might be oh, like 400 looks good for the pitcher when I'm shooting horizontal, but 300 is going to be a little short. But 100 to 300 would be kind of cool for getting the batter if I'm up close, you know, sitting behind uh, behind home plate. That could be good, but it's going to be interesting to see how this handles because how many people are spending $9,500 for a, for a lens like this? Yeah, I, I can't see them selling a ton of them, but I do think for a, a professional sports shooter, I mean, this is a, such a great lens to have in your arsenal. I think they're going to sell every single copy they can make. Oh, I agree, but I don't think they're going to make a ton of them. If no, I no, they're guess. probably not going to make a ton of them. They're yeah. probably apologizing as we speak for the demand being so <laughs> we high. We sold ten of them, but yeah. <laughs> guys, we sold out of our initial allotment of twelve. We apologize that it, we didn't expect the demand to be so high. And apparently, they only had what two in America that they were handing out to uh, reviewers. So we didn't even. I was again know about they only it beforehand. Had well, I was told they only had like two samples and they were going to Explorers of Light. I saw Gordon Lang had a hands-on. He always gets hands-on in uh, Are you Europe. kidding me? He did, yeah. Are you kidding me he right does, now? He does really good stuff, though. He's so but specific about every little detail. Did he shoot with it? I don't think they let him shoot with it. I think it was more just like an overview of what it looked like and how it See, works. Why did that happen in Europe, but it couldn't happen here? I remember he got, if you recall, he got the R5 hands-on before anybody as well. Europe always See, gives him hands-on early. What people don't know is that Canon Europe, Canon USA, Canon Australia, Canon Germany, Canon France, Canon Canada, they all work separate. Yep. Now they 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 have different methods of doing things and they might have I guess because maybe it's smaller and people can drive into London or take a train into London, maybe they went ahead and, and were like, here, let's go have a hands on. But shit, I didn't know they had a hands on yet. Yeah, it was only him. Uh, I saw B and H had a, a hands on for obvious reasons, uh, and then Canon USA themselves, like Rudy Winston, did a, a overview of it. Um, we love now. His I'm videos. upset. Now I'm upset. 
<laughs> Sometimes I don't tell you these things because I know it's going to like ruin your day because you didn't get hands on. You didn't ruin my day, Stephen. But it's going to piss you off. I mean, I'm going to get it tomorrow uh, as early as Saturday is what I'm told. Well, that means you're second. But I have to decide whether I not fuck first, you. Last, I have to de- whatever. <laughs> I have to decide whether or not I want to get it Saturday uh, because I, I don't want to wait around for the delivery. Do you know what I mean? Well, and like, we were just talking about this before we went on air. Uh, it's going to rain Saturday, Saturday night anyway and Sunday night. Or actually, no, I think it's Sunday morning. Well, there's a whole lot of Phillies games coming up to photograph, but my my nephew plays base, plays Little League, or not Little League, he plays uh, T-ball or coach pitch on Saturday at 1230. Now that actually you could shoot for sure, because it's not going to be raining then. Yeah. Well, and I could stand wherever I want to stand. Now that's at 1230. If the lens gets here at 11, I can make it in time, but I also... Maybe I want to ride my bike because it's a nice day. But do I? Is, is it, it, do is it I, an overnight one where it's going to be there by like ten thirty a.m. or something like that? I think for Saturday delivery, it would be maybe by eleven. Okay, hmm. but it just sucks that like I want to ride my bike and I don't want to wait around till eleven doing nothing. Could Dan so get it I for could you? also have it. No, because it's a it's a weekend. Well, I'm just saying if he's home. Well, I could have it shipped to my house. I could have I could literally have it shipped to my brother's house, which would be smarter if they can guarantee it's going to get to my brother's house on Saturday and I can just pick it up there. That might be an option that I might do. I know oh, do no I thought they already shipped this. it. I didn't realize they haven't shipped it yet. No, if they shipped it, it would have been here today or tomorrow, but they weren't, they're not in the office because they were at NAB. Gotcha. Gotcha. And so that's why like they weren't able to get it to get it sent out, but I'm excited to use it because I mean, it's a it's a 100 to 302.8. Oh, it's, it's another great. one of those yeah. unique RF lenses. And if it is light. Oh, and I didn't realize this. I forgot that no one has a 302.8 mirrorless. But Sony, uh-huh. remember, Sony announced a development of one. And that's all they told us. It was yep. one line. Yep. Well, then this, we had an entire NDA call just for them to say, hey, we're releasing a 302.8. And that's it. Literally yeah, that no details terrible. at all. It's like, what? Yeah. What? You guys could have so was this. That was totally terrible. Uh, and then I forgot about that. I forgot about it too. But this lens puts that to shame. Oh, for sure. To have the the one hundred. But but I guess if it's three thousand dollars less, sure. Then but then when that's you're already different. spending that kind of money, I'd rather spend the extra two three grand for a, a much more versatile lens like this. One hundred to three hundred would be really good on a basketball court down low because you could have one camera with a twenty four to seventy or wider. You could have another one with the 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 one hundred to three hundred on well, it. That's what I, I I was saying to you before we went on air is you know I think this is a great lens for you because you can have the hundred to three hundred, your twenty to seventy f two, and then maybe bring a, a prime like a one thirty five one eight or a you know eighty five one two, and that's kind of like your <laughs> trinity. Seriously, yeah, but Stephen at twelve point seven ultra inches, wide. But at 12.7 inches, traveling with that? Imagine taking that to Paris. Well, yeah. I, I don't know if I would travel with it like that. But if you're doing a shoot locally, I, I would definitely bring it along. Yeah, but again, it fills my bag. It does, I don't think it's going to fit in my bag standing, especially yeah. with the lens hood on. So now that was one of the reasons I got rid of a 302.8 Nikon way back in the day well, was the fact that it was like, if I take this 302.8... I can't take X or it takes a while to change. The biggest thing too, if I recall, is that the 300 F4 PF came out and that was such yeah. a tiny lens and hey, it's F4 versus 2.8. It's not that big of a deal. Uh, I wish Nikon came out with that again, like a 300 PF version for the uh, the Z mount. They really haven't yeah, the- done any of those like, like Canon did the 800 F11, the 600 F11. They really need something like that as well. Like a nice, small, small, tiny lens that can throw in your bag, but it has a ton of, you know, zoom to it. Yeah, and that was the thing with that 300 uh, F4 caused me to sell my 300 28 because now I can take everything I want and an F4. Like, yes, 28 is sharper, better, but in the grand scheme of things, the amount of times I was using the 300 wasn't worth it to, to, to have to carry it over my shoulder and possibly miss other shots. And now I would just have this 300 F4 in the front of the bag just in case I needed it. And hey, it, it, it uh, takes your favorite things too, teleconverters, the 1.4X and the 2X uh, from Canon, which a lot of their other mega zooms, like the 100 to 500, that only accepts it at a certain range. Uh, I think it's from like 300 to 500, you can use it or something like that, if I recall. But that'll be a nice option because you can make it a, what, a 200 to 400 like F4 or like a 300 to 600 five, six or something like that. So with the one four converter, your wide is a 140 and your tele is a 420. It's that's, actually 420 that's today. That's four. Right. That's an F4. You okay. put on a 2X converter by itself. You're at 200 to 600 at a um, aperture values 5.6. That's a yeah, nice at range. Five, six. Yeah. I mean, it, it is. I mean, that max is like a 200 to 600, but 
it's still going to be big and I still don't like teleconverters as you know I only like teleconverters if it's a built-in TC I think that is a little different because it's actually optimized for that type of lens you know totally get it imagine if this had a TC in it built in and it was for that price as well and you really had like every single thing you needed for a mega zoom built into this lens that would be incredible you wouldn't it there would, would be, be no need for a 4028 or a 600 f4 I mean I still want a 402.8 sure it's, it's a much different look but it's also what's that 15 grand it's 16 i think it's 16 at this point 16 wow i think i think i think it's up there for the rf version it's actually no it's only twelve hundred dollars twelve thousand i'm sorry twelve thousand dollars yeah you 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 would have sold a lot of them at twelve hundred dollars and the 600 f4 is thirteen thousand dollars mm. what's the one that was oh it's the nikon 400 28 with the tc, TC. that one's like 15 16. grand yeah Nonetheless, I'm happy and excited to get this lens. Uh, hopefully, I don't have to buy one. Or if I do buy one, that I can get it for a lot less expensive. Or I can get a long-term loaner. Because that's my goal, is to have this to grab and go whenever I want to take it out yep. into the world and shoot with. How long do you have it for? Oh, we didn't specify, Stephen, but I might lose the <laughs> so return label. Basically forever until they ask for it back. <laughs> uh, yes. I have a feeling they're going to ask for this one back pretty quick. Yeah. Because they I'm only have 12 rip- that they made. Uh, well, yeah, and there's only like two in the country for testing, but yep. I am probably going to request a long-term loaner, or if I do really like it, ask them what I can buy one for. I might as well do that through Alan's Camera, alanscamera.com slash fro. Whoa. Speaking of alanscamera.com slash fro, this has transition, doesn't have anything to do with that, but I wanted to bring up something that Nikon had going for them back in the day <laughs> that ended up being a miss. It ended up, it had the potential to put them ahead of Sony before Sony, which it was before Sony cameras were were, were out in the market with mirrorless and way before what Canon was doing. Nikon had the one lineup, the Nikon one. They had the J1 and they had the Nikon one. They had something else, but it was an interchangeable lens mirrorless camera and it was awesome at the time you had like full autofocus coverage of 90 focusing points across the screen you could shoot super fast you could watch as the focusing points moved in the electronic viewfinder it was mind-blowing what you were doing in 2011 2012 when these things came out they even had a nikon one version that was waterproof Oh, I remember in, that. What the, you could take it in the water. I took it, it called to, like a J something or it, well, the the J one S or J one R something. It was some waterproof version or the J W or something. Yeah, something where like it was that. a water literally didn't need a housing. It had the gaskets and everything. You could get le- now. Don't change your lens underwater or change the battery <laughs> underwater. But you could change lenses. You had to get the specific ones for underwater. I took it to. Uh, Cancun or something once and used it. It was very difficult to use, to be honest with you. The settings were hard to change. It just wasn't a very intuitive camera at the time, the underwater one, but the others made sense. They weren't perfect. They didn't have good grips on them. The biggest downfall, do you know what it was, Stephen? I already told you, didn't I? Uh, If you told me, I forget. You forgot? That's why you get 12.5%. (laughs) Because it's so so important that I remember something like that. The Nikon 1's biggest failure was the fact that it had a one-inch sensor. And when we say one-inch sensor, we're not talking about a sensor that measures one inch. It's not like a 35 millimeter. You mean type 1. I don't mean type type 1. DP That's review is DP gone, review Steven. says. They're gone. <laughs> they're, because they're gone for reasons just like that. Because coming up with stupid names. Oh, that's a type 0. 0.5. That's type 1. Shut to up, To make DP it a little review. easier to understand, instead of saying 1 inch, we're going to say type 1. Because, you know, it's right. not saying the same exact thing, just different way. <laughs> 1 inch sensor is not that big of a sensor. You see that in po- some point and shoot cameras. And the problem was, I think that Nikon was afraid. They were afraid to, to kill their DSLR business. Sure. They were afraid. Let's just like Kodak. Kodak was afraid to go digital because it would kill their chemistry business and kill their paper business and film business. But they didn't realize, or they did, but they failed, that it would have actually made their business 10 times stronger. And in this case, Nikon was really early in this world. They did an awesome job with this whole system, but it fell short because even if they just did APS-C, it would have been better. But they didn't. They did a really teeny tiny shitty sensor. I wonder if that wasn't up to them, though. I wonder if the technology just wasn't there enough power to power an APS-C sensor with that kind of technology, you know? No. I mean, 2011, that's going back. 
I'm going to just say that they were afraid and they didn't want to step on the DSLR toes. They're money winners. And speaking of that, you know, you had Sony. They, we, I think we've talked about this before, but they took the risk because they didn't have anything to risk when they went mirrorless. You know, they really had nothing to begin with where Canon and Nikon were late to the jump because they had that entire DSLR range of cameras. Their exactly. entire business. Yeah. I just wanted to bring that up because if you go onto my YouTube channel or my website, you type in Nikon One or Nikon J1, there's early video of me being invited to New York for the last time, (laughs) getting yelled at by Nikon at the event. Steven didn't go with me for this because they told me not to talk to the models. So I proceed to interview the models who aren't allowed to give any information, but I interviewed them anyway. Steven, don't listen to the audio because the audio is so bad it's so bad. Oh, this is 11 years ago, it says. Is yeah, that's when you 12, got a hands-on 20? preview, it says? Oh, shit. I thought you were going to say a hand job. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know where you were going with that one, uh, Stephen. Yeah, hands-on yeah, preview. I don't There's think a, I worked with you yet. I'm pretty sure I didn't. The, 11 years ago. Steve Heiner. Yep. He's talking to me about this system. And I'm there talking to these uh, models about the system and saying what I like or don't like. And that video is there. <laughs> so uh, the camera was cool. It just didn't make sense to have a crop sensor camera look you got a you got a nikon j1 unbox and sniff test video as well how'd that do steven Thirty one thousand views from 11 nice. years ago and nice. you got a nice That's good you got a nice zoom angle with picture in picture <laughs> really yeah instead of cutting to the other angle you just you put a picture in picture of a like a zoomed in angle that's good steven <laughs> I knew how to edit back then, yeah. said no one ever. That's fine. So anyway, I suggest that you go check that out if you want to take a walk down memory lane. Um, a couple more things today before we have to rapidly wrap up this Raw Talk episode. I can't believe that in the news, Canon decided to announce that they're building an NFT marketplace called Cadabra. And my joke was, what, Abracadabra, your money goes poof? Like, <laughs> that was the idea that you guys came up with? It's like the South Park episode, and it's gone. Yeah. Can I invest hey, my money I, in this bank? And it's gone. Hi, I'd like to take this money. My, my grandmother gave me $100 and I'd like to open a bank account. Okay, sign right here. And, and it's gone. And it's gone. What, what do you mean it's gone? It's uh, gone. Your money is, is gone. What, what do you mean it's gone? You, I, I put it into the bank. Well, that's fantastic. A really smart decision, young man. We can put that check in a money market mutual fund. Then we'll reinvest the earnings into foreign currency accounts with compounding interest, and it's gone. Uh, what? It's gone. It's all gone. What's all gone? The money in your account. It didn't do too well. It's gone. What do you mean? I I have $100. Not anymore, you don't. Poof. So it really makes absolutely no sense in 2023. It didn't make sense in 2020 when the whole NFT world was starting to blow up and literally blow. You know what? I was at the dentist this morning, Stephen, and they have all the magazines up on the shelf. And the one magazine they had was Forbes, and it has a picture of Sam Bankman Freed on it. And it goes, is he the next Warren Buffett? Question mark. Wow. How old? And Obviously, the that magazine it, was like a year old. Yeah, it, it, that magazine's definitely a year old. And on the bottom, it was like, or will it crash and burn? I was like, oh. or it will crash and burn. Foreshadowing. <laughs> yeah, I was like, ah, oh, this didn't age well. <laughs> Sam Bankman oh. Freed didn't age well, and he's going to age pretty well in jail, right? What, was it you just telling me about Taylor Swift? Tr- they tried to like sponsor her entire tour, FTX? Yeah, so FTX wanted to sponsor the tour for $100 million. Wow. Now, one of the one of the websites, news websites, it might have been a big website, got it wrong. They wrote $100 billion. And I was like, guys, how do you make a mistake in your article and no one catches that you put $100 billion when it was $100 million? Because $100 billion makes absolutely no sense. Hundred uh, billion. It's a little Here, different. Taylor, uh, we're offering you a hundred billion. We don't have a hundred billion, but we're gonna offer it to you. Geez. So anyway, she was offered a hundred million for them to 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 uh sponsor her Eurus tour, uh or whatever Eris tour, whatever it's called right now. Which is funny because if she did take the money, the business would have been gone before her tour started. So she they, they basically made her out to be like a genius. She's like she chose not to take it because she asked one question. How is this not illegal? And they couldn't answer it. And she uh, decided not to move forward with it. Taylor Swift has a current net worth of around $400 million. Good for her. Hey, Taylor, you're single, right? She's probably making I, an extra 100 mil just on this current tour, I bet. I know th- I know this guy that's single, Taylor. And he's not going to get upset that you're more famous than he is because that's totally fine. And he he's really cool and he's got nice hair and he can take photos of you. Me. Hey, Taylor, I'm single. I'd go out with you. 
Is, would you approve of that, Stephen? Sure. Yeah. She has a private I'll be, jet. Uh, yeah, I'll be your con- I'll be her concert photographer. You can be her boyfriend. That sounds like a song. <laughs> Jared is my boyfriend. Steven is my concert photographer. That's a great Jared song. is my boyfriend. Definitely he makes number one me single. happy as he goes to Paris. One night in Paris with Jared. One night in Taylor with Jared in Paris. That's a call back to last All week's episode. Four inches of Jared. 12.7. <laughs> 12.7. 12 point, he's got 12.7 makes me happy. Yeah. Taylor Swift has a song called 12.7. It's named after me. 4.6. 4.6. Man, I I forgot she's only 33 years old. That's mind blowing how much she's done in that, in that 33 years and just the past 10 years. Taylor, if you're listening right now, (laughs) I, um, I'm single and, uh, you can come on my podcast and I will not finish the next statement that came to my mind. <laughs> so you come on my podcast and then we can go on a date in Paris on your private jet. All right. So I got an email. The uh, Dude, I got a weird email the other day and I don't even actually want to tell you what it was. It wasn't even an email. It was to the old voicemail number as if I was going to reply to it. The 267-45463, whatever the number was. I had a voicemail where people used to leave voicemails to. And that's how they would send in questions back in the day. I had a Google Voice number. I still have it. Oh. Someone still, for whatever reason, someone still sent a message. I don't, I don't want to talk about that one. But another email came in, which was actually pretty good. And I'm going to read it to you. I'm a professional artist, oil painter. I've done 500 plus art shows. Good for you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've heard every stupid criticism imaginable. I want to heap praise on you. And I hope that it's helpful. And you remember this for yourself. Because the one stupid comment can linger in your mind. I'm hoping I can help so help so it does not ever affect you. I just bought the R8 from your recommendation. Beep, beep, beep. Did you hear that, Cannon? Beep. <laughs> Dump beep. the money over there. Right no, there. No, to the left a little bit. Yep, perfect. Right there. <laughs> I just bought the R8 on your recommendation when I thought I was going to buy an A7 IV, even rented an A7 III Sony and thought it was the camera for me. Why would I change my mind after only watching two videos from you when I had already watched 20 videos from others on the A7 IV? Because all others make shitty videos and you're the greatest ever. <laughs> he didn't say that. <laughs> he didn't say that. So one, relevant information straightforward. Two, backed by real world examples, personal photos from you. They are great. Three, you give your opinion with passion. Four, I like you talk fast. I normally watch YouTube at 1.75 or 2x speed. I watch your videos at normal speed. That's true. That's very true. I only watch yours at maybe like 1.5 at the most. I watch mine at 2x when I need to preview it. Five, subjects move quickly and I feel feel they follow a relevant path. I had a question and you provided the answer. Six, I am not held hostage looking at your mug because you're trying to impress me with how beautiful you are. Others are too engaged at seeing themselves on camera yep. if you say it show that. it b-roll yeah if you say no talking it, show head it. here no that was steven's major uh initiative when he first got here because it was just 10 years five ago? minutes of just you ranting every single video right if you say it show it and then, and then if you and yeah anyway we don't need to go into the rest yeah, of it yeah. seven you are not afraid to say this is what i would do wow keep going buddy you are on it i hope you i hope one day i can come anywhere near your presence on film and it keeps going. By the way, I did not think I would like you. Never heard of you and had zero investment in what you were going to tell me. Remember, you were a peripheral to what I thought I was going to do. Amazing exclamation point about me. I formulated the world's first glow in the dark oil paint. It's the best glow paint experience. I need to market it better. Hence a camera that performs in low light. I was wondering if you could suggest some of your favorite books that helped you become who you are today. Congratulations. Yeah. I told him, you know what books I told him? None. I don't read. I can't read because my eyes suck. <laughs> No, seriously, there were no uh, books in business that I read that got me to this point. Well, I thought Gary Vee was kind of a big one for you in the beginning, right? I never read that book. I talked to him in person. And then I read the book after I already had the site going. Oh, really? I thought that yeah. uh, the, the right jab hook, whatever. No, book. Crush It. It was Crush, crush It. That's it a Crush time. It. Yeah, yeah. No, I did not. Um, crush It was not the reason I became successful. Huh. 
Okay. But I did follow a very similar similar path to that. So did this guy actually watch the comparison video? Is, it, is that what he's referring to? Or just the he random R8 He watched two R8 of our video? videos. I think we put out two R8 videos and that was it. Okay. Well, we just put out the comparison, the R8 versus R6, Mark II versus R6, and then the R8 versus A7 IV. So I didn't know if he was talking about that. Yeah. Well, I don't know. May have been one. Yeah, may have been that. And if may you guys have haven't that. watched it yet, check out those videos. Now check on the YouTube videos. Now on the YouTubes. Stephen, we got we got to wrap it up because I got to get going to another call at three thirty here. So, guys, thank you for listening to Raw Talk Forty Seven. As always, you could give us feedback by texting us. Oh, where's the number? What's the number? 313-710-9729. That's 313-710-9729. Hashtag Dan still doesn't get a raise because hashtag Stan still, Dan still does not listen to the podcast. At least he hasn't told us that he's listened and I think he would have said something by now. Eh, maybe. But yeah, if you guys can also leave a, a rating on Apple Podcast, five stars, please. Or uh, Spotify, five stars, please. New episodes we shoot for every Friday. Yep is always the plan and we're 47 weeks into it and we will continue to move forward in doing them so thank you guys very much for for listening steven thank you for joining You're anything welcome. else you want to add that's it are you sure about that yes thank you steven thank you everybody jared poland for see ya bye